Well, hello everybody. It's been a little bit since I've done a longer build along on the channel. I'm starting a chef knife for a friend of mine and he ordered a knife, uh, more or less a duplicate of one that I built not long ago and that is a um, 10 inch chef with a jailbird feather pattern. That's chain pattern that's been feathered. So for the first time I'm going to be showing uh, a complete walkthrough of how I build my family of chain patterns, how to get clean links and stuff. And I'll be taking you along for the ride. So uh, I hope you enjoy the content. And uh, without further ado, let's get right into some Damascus steel. Here are two billets. I often start a, a larger chain loaf as two billets. It's just easier to manage the amount of steel that way. <clears throat> and then that way, if one of them kind of doesn't distort how I want it to, I still got one to work on and I can end up with some steel without starting all over. But usually what will happen is I'll weld these together, uh, distort them how I want, and then rip them both. We'll get into that later and then combine them um, kind of midway during the process, provided that they both look um, good enough. At any rate, let's take a look at the size and layout. So these are really simple. This is 1080 on the outsides, heavy layer of 1080, and 15 and 20 in the middle, a thick stripe. Uh, it's about a quarter of the volume of 15 and 20 as 1080. Roughly, you can kind of be you know, inside or outside of that as long as you're fairly close to that guideline. You just want this to be a bold line. And uh, what is this? <clears throat> About two and an eighth tall by almost eight inches long by inch and a half wide. Both of these are the same. They're all prepped up. I'm just going to tack them, put handles on them, and then uh, they're going to go into the fire. Okay, here we've got the billets ready for the fire. I've got long handles on them. And uh, these handles have tails bent on the end at a right angle. It gives you a nice hook, easy to grab, and also helps you index um, where the flats of the billet were to begin with. So anytime you've got a stripe like this that you need to distort uh, to a certain angle, it's much, much better to have uh, something flat to grab onto to control the billet, keep it from twisting in unwanted ways off the hammer, so on and so forth. A um, couple of notes here. So they have a side stripe of MIG, not burnt in super deep, and then almost all of the dome of the weld ground off, just so that these are tacked enough that, um, say, this top and bottom layer don't pop loose and begin to let us out in the fire, open like a book, because they're heating faster than the stuff on the inside of the billet, and they have nowhere to go but to buckle outward. We don't want that. Uh, so we prevented that, just that on both sides, a couple of stripes on the ends. And then uh, when I welded on the handles, I just made sure that this bent tab was exactly in line with the 15 and 20 stripes. So it should be real easy to keep indexed. Um, it's along a feature rather than across it. So I don't have to remember any little extra trick of like it was a cross, not a long. It, it is the 15 and 20 for all intents and purposes. Um, and then we're just gonna dunk it in Caro and throw it in the fire, but you'll see that. Okay, here, coming out of the forge, we're good and hot, and we need to weld this first off, and then smack it down to approximately a square cross-section, so that's the first step here.
once we have it chewed up approximately to square and the sides all planished out then we're gonna put it long ways on the on the dies and um, get it to an approximately even thickness with fairly sharp corners This time around I'm knocking the corners in, first forming it into an octagonal cross section, and then re-squaring it fully to um, create points out of what were the sides. That's the first step of this distortion. So on this heat, we are modifying that first 45 degree distortion by rolling it slightly to the right to push the um, corner of the diagonal line we've created a little bit off of the corner on both sides. That's essential. We just separate the diagonal line from the corner. And then we're going to flip it 90 degrees from that to continue accentuating that effect and form a slightly new square off of the original 45 degree re-square. We're swerving that line here to create an S of 15 and 20 that's slightly dis detached from the corners. And then once we have that set of new flats started, we're going to take it with the corner to the top and the right still and just smash it down flat until we get rectangular bar about twice as wide as it is tall and that should form a nicely bent S off of the corners a little bit at the corners and with a nearly horizontal or fully horizontal uh, midsection. You'll see what I mean when we get to um, looking at the end grain. An additional note here is that I'm hitting it pretty hard at a lower heat in order to bring those corners out square and sharp. And then I'll be putting it through the rolling mill next. And here we go with the rolling mill. This is just to get an even thickness all the way down, pull it out a slight bit more, but just get it to where it's all going to grind about the same. And then uh, I'll alternate a little bit between the rolling mill and hammer just to make sure that the, uh, the other thickness of the aspect ratio remain, it stays non-tapered here. So we want to not have a taper in any direction and we want to have real sharp corners and then a flat bar. It's really nice to have well squared up stock that way um, for precision going into your pattern later and for the best welds possible. Forge is cooling down. Just got done forging this last one out. They both run been run through the rolling mill at the same roller height. So they should play well together uh, after I get them annealed and then chop the ends off, have a check etch at the pattern, stuff like that. But the, as soon as these cool down a little bit, I'm chopping the handles off and giving them a DET anneal. I'm gonna talk that, about that a little bit more. Um, while, while I'm showing them getting uh, put in the kiln, we'll go through programming that a little bit and talk about it. Here we are over at the bandsaw table, which is the de facto reading table and <clears throat> handwork bench in this room of the shop. And we are reading uh, Knife Engineering by Dr. Laren Thomas. Tons of good info in here. And here is an interesting thing. I've always been a... Um, subcritical anneal guy it's it's quicker than slow cooling things with the forge or uh, in vermiculite or something like that and then it works on a wider range of steels you know hyper eutectoid steels hypo eutectoid steels not just your eutectoid kind of uh, middle of the range low alloy carbon steels like 1080 um, and i found that it just got me softer results um, as well which is important when you're going to be bandsaw ripping things uh, more recently, I've been trying the DET anneal, and I've had good results with that. The cool thing is that when you DET anneal things to grind them, um, 
the actual annealing provides you with a better setup for your hardening afterwards, which is nice, but I've just gotten used to using it um, during intermediate forging uh, procedures for Damascus too, where necessary. And so now that we're gonna rip those bars next, hold on, cup of coffee here, can't ignore it. Good stuff. So we're gonna be bandsaw ripping these bars. We want them nice and soft. And so we are going to look at this here. This is page 232. And he talks about recommended annealing procedures. Um, here uh, I'll read, the short DET anneal developed by Verhoeven combines a relatively short low temperature austenitis and intermediate cooling rate to provide very fine spheroidized carbides, which provides the good machinability of spheroidized carbides, that's what we want, machinability is bandsaw friendly, but with better hardening response and toughness due to finer carbides. So this is all very good. This is what we're gonna do here. Um, so we're gonna not look under high alloy steels, we're gonna look under low alloy steels here and um, with furnace. So for low alloy steels that will be annealed in a furnace, heat to annealing temperature, hold for 30 minutes and cool at 670 degrees Fahrenheit per hour to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit and air cool. Let's see, recommended annealing temperatures are shown in table 19.3. Well, that's on this next page here. So we're gonna go down here and we're gonna see there's 1075, 1084. We have 1080, it's not on the list, but it's right in between these two alloys. Pretty dang similar and these all have the same temperature anyway. So we're going to be using 1365 Fahrenheit um, for 30 minutes, and then we're gonna cool at 675, uh, 670 Fahrenheit per hour to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit and then air cool after that. And that should leave us with nice, soft, band sawable stuff. So let's go do that. Okay, we're at the Paragon Kiln. I love this Paragon Kiln. Some people are even heat guys, that's fine. But Paragon gave me this kiln after I won Forged in Fire. No strings attached. I think uh, the president was just a fan of the show, and it has been a marvelously useful tool for me ever since. Super well built. I love this thing. Anyway, so let's write a program real quick. Okay, stop back. Program. Let's put it in program 7. Enter. Uh, ramp 1. Full speed. Yes, up to 1365, boom. Uh, and we are not going to hold that for, oh, sorry, we are gonna hold that, duh, 30 minutes. Okay, it's already in there, good. Uh, argon off, ramp two, so 670 degrees per hour. Uh, let's see, to a temperature of 12, Hundred degrees. We're not going to hold that for any time. Argon's going to be off. Ramp three is zero. Uh, and enter start. A little bit of grinding after the softening up. I've done a little bit of work here. We got the surfaces of these bars surface ground lightly, not enough to get all of the scale off, but enough to make them cut easier on the bandsaw and be easier to mark. Um, I've cut the ends off of each bar and then I've cut each bar in half. Reason being that um, when you just cut the end off of a bar, you know, the last half inch or whatever, where the MIG was, where this distortion was weird, uh, and you etch that, you're not really gonna get an accurate picture of the the grain throughout most of the bar, the pattern orientation and distortion. So it's better to also section a bar through the middle if you want to like really have a good look at <clears throat> what the distortion is in most of the bar. And these were, I mean, each of these pieces is eight inches long, so I would have had to cut them anyway. But in, in this case, it's very handy to be able to etch there too. So let's take a look at the etches and see um, the range of results you might get from the forging that I described and uh, what it means for our project going forward. So these two are from one bar. Now let's look at the end that was near the middle. 
they're the same as each other because they were cut apart. Let's see if you can see them. Yeah, check that out. That's an acceptable result. That is a pronounced S shape with a pretty horizontal metal. And it's got enough room for us to split it, although not a lot of room for error. It's not ideal, but it'll work. We're gonna split each one of these down the middle and separate this into two curves, two um, corners rather than one S curve. But let's look at what the other ends looked like. So much milder, this wouldn't work at all if it was like this through the whole bar. Fortunately, you can see where this was tapering off toward the end these um, will begin to look a lot more like that, you know, if you get very far up into the bar at all. So this bar will work. And then let's have a look at this one. Uh, so actually even the, uh, the booger ends would work pretty well on this bar. You can see, again, this is an S shape. It's more spread out and thinner. It didn't upset as much. Um, it's pretty much off the corner the exact amount we would want, so that's nice. But uh, let's look at the cut middle, and those are really nice. We have pretty horizontal middles. They could be a little bit more curved to like straight up at the edges here, but uh, it'll look fine in the finished bar. And this gives us plenty of room to rip down the middle and separate that into two very distinct corners. So we'll make a chain link out of this bar. We'll make a chain link out of the other bar. And they'll both look kind of different than each other, but when mixed up into a final pattern of like two chains side by side, actually the fact that they're not exactly the same as each other kind of gives it a little bit of extra life and charm, I feel like. So here's what we're going to do next. I'm going to put these yeah, <clears throat> edge up here. And we are going to mark where halfway through that is. I like these little steel rulers. So this bar is one and five eighths through. Yeah, half of which is nine sixteenths. Oh, that's super wrong. That's super wrong. It's a, let's see, half inch plus five sixteenths. So eight sixteenths plus five sixteenths, that's 13 sixteenths. Much better. Uh, and this is a 30 second scale. So 13 sixteenths is 28 30 seconds. Or Jesus, 26 30 seconds. Uh, well, I never said that I graduated math with any good grades. Okay, so we're going to mark where we want the center line on this to be. And importantly, it should also look like the end of the center here. Um, which on this bar, it's distorted pretty evenly, so that is presenting as the measured center of the bar. Also happens to be visually the center of the pattern. So that's good. Well, that's pretty inaccurate there. Let's do it this way. light out a little bit more and get that lined up with that I'm gonna use that to scribe it so now we have our center line of our bar scribed on that we're gonna do all four bars that way I'll bring you back when I'm done with that. Yeah, we got both ends of each billet scribed up the center line now. And, yep, those are all good. So now, we're gonna find what is the cleaner side of each one. Let's see here. Okay, and there we go. Then we're gonna paint a stripe of die chem down the middle. Blue die chem. 
Only blue dye cam will work. That red stuff won't even be adequate to the task. Same with that spray stuff. Only blue brush on. Let's see here. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna let that dry. Fortunately, this lamp is a little bit warm. It's not LED, it's <clears throat> a fluorescent bulb still. I may retrofit it. I'll be able to bring it down close to these and dry them out a little faster maybe if they take a while. back when those are dry <clears throat> so with the layout lacquer dry we're taking and setting this combination square to the center line on one end to the center line on the other and we're going to scribe a line between for a nice straight scribe line to follow with our saw for the rip cut. We're gonna get all these marked out, and then I'm gonna go put these on the rip saw, and we'll have a look at that. We're over here at the marble saw, and I am going to show you as much as I can of this before actually turning it on and clamping this vise, because the saw itself is rather loud, and uh, so I'll explain I'm about to set up a little bit, then we'll turn the saw on and any further explaining I'll be able to do will have to be by voiceover. But let's check this out. So I made a clamping fixture. This is just a big plate of 3 8 steel that fits in the vise here. And when I made it, I clamped it in the vise and like cut the edge of it off. So the edge of it is true to the actual travel of the saw with it clamped in the vise because it's been cut to be in the saw that it's being used on. And then, uh, so I've drilled and tapped sets of uh, half inch by 13 coarse thread holes. Here, here, here. I'll probably add some here and here later as I'm ripping longer bars. But this allows me to use these um, step and strap clamps, machinist type clamps. Usually you'd use them with T slots in a table like this, but here they just go into the fixture. I'm cl toe clamping them here to the edge of the plate with where the saw will cut fairly close to the edge of the plate because I don't want that blade cutting force exerting uh, undue leverage against the clamp here. So I, I do want to be cutting in fairly close to the edge of the plate. And then when I bring the saw up, I'll have it running and I'll make sure it's centered on that line. And then I'm going to take the, um, and I need to build a jig for this too, but you know, I just haven't been running this saw all that long, so it's not fully tooled up for my uses. But I'll take this uh, and I'll use it to measure how far it is to the edge of the billet from the T-slot. Same here, so it's so I can set this end of the cut to the exact same spacing as that end of the cut, because it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly where the edge of this slot is with it. Eh, you get the picture. Uh, anyway, I will fire the saw up now and you can kind of watch me do some of that. Okay, so blades running, coolant's on, vise is clamped, and we're bringing it slowly up to the line there. You need to have your blade real close to the line. This is an area where you really don't want to have a cut that's off even a little bit and waste any steel. It's got to be just splitting it perfectly. Adjust tension on the clamps a little bit, tap it around in the clamps with it partially clamped, stuff like that. Tell you sure you got it good and uh, ready to rip because you know, once you're cutting, you pretty much bought it. Here I'm using an adjustable square to measure distance to the edge of the billet off of a feature from the table, namely the top of the T-slot. That can certainly help positioning things.
Okay, so that went really well. Got a pretty nice new blade on there. This steel is nice and soft from that DET anneal. The coolant keeps it wet, keeps that blade from wearing. And we got just a nice split right where we wanted to to separate those two corners. Now we have the corners of loops. Uh, so now we just have to repeat that procedure with three more bars, and then we'll be off to creating the other elements of our chain. Okay, we've got all the bars ripped. Here we can see that this saw generates a ferocious amount of swarf doing all that cutting, and it's mixed with coolant, so we got a little cleanup to do. But uh, we got nice, clean rips on all these bars. All of them are pretty well centered up, except for this one. It's just maybe half of a blade thickness off at the end. Nothing to really create too much of an issue. Um, but yeah, so now we're going to process these a little bit further, and uh, we'll show you that too. Here we are, post-rip. Clean things up a little bit, be bird. Now let's have a look at uh, what we do. So there's this one, that one got ripped. And then this is the other half of that same bar. The Both of these are the middle cut, not the end cut. So we get the least distortion here. So we're going to break this one uh, out and put it next to this one. And see, there we have part of a link, especially if it's separated like that. And then we're gonna take the other two and put them next to each other. And we got the other half of a link. And then let's put that all together and see how it looks. And because it's mirrored up from a, two sides of the same cut and everything's staggered, everything mates up pretty well. So now, we can just separate these two and put the horizontal links in, the side links in with other pieces. And let's see how that's going to work with our other bar. Again, this one was a little bit more spread out. So let's swap these. I'll take this one and this one and swap them. Let's look at the resulting link. Oh, not bad. And let's have a look at this one. Yep, the same. So let's put that here. This link looks a little bit more abstract, but that's okay because by the time all of these links are really small, you know, uh, eight links wide in the finished feather, uh, they will look almost the same as each other and suitably interesting. So with this one, I think the links will be on the left and right connection. That way the link is more linear and it doesn't have these weird points. Um, so we'll make it be, let's see. Yeah, this link is a little bit longer that way. This link is longer that way. So yeah, we'll connect them like that. So now we just gotta make the interspersing connecting links between these two to make them into a connected chain. Well, thanks so much everybody for staying along for the ride. I know this has been a bit of a long format, but I'm really trying to cover this in depth um, so that a person could watch this and learn how to make this with the least amount of mistakes possible that uh, you know will save them some time compared to what it took me the first time through. Anyway, um, thanks for watching again, and I'll see you on the next installment.